Yes, what you see on the screen is not a misprint. We will be talking about the Song of Songs, but we are going to start with Ephesians today. Um, and so I need to give you just a bit of warning uh, in advance. So uh, over the next, not counting today, but uh, the next three weeks, we're going to be on a walking tour, so to speak, of the book, one of the most provocative books in the entirety of the canon, in the entirety of the Bible. And so we're going to be on a walking tour of the book entitled Song of Songs. And, and my warning is, is several things today, and so we're going to read just uh, Ephesians in a moment, and it's going to be kind of a, a backdrop. But my warning today is, is that even before we get going, uh, you're probably going to be uncomfortable. And just know that I love you. And just know that sometimes when some of this stuff gets tense over the next few weeks, or even this morning some, um, if it, when it gets tense, know that there is grace upon grace. You go, what in the world are we going to talk about? It's going to be cool. But the book of Psalms is, no other way to say it, the book of Psalms is about romantic, erotic, sexual love between partners. And here's the reason I picked the book. By a show of hands, be honest, right? Because we're in church, and Jesus will get you if you're not honest. Not really, but it sounded good. So here's the deal. Be honest. By a show of hands, how many times in your entire church life as an individual have you ever heard a message or series of messages related to sex or sexuality? If you have, one, two, three, okay. All right, impressively, I've seen a few hands. Uh, one of the things that, that um, I kind of committed myself to is, as the Lord and I continue to, uh, he continues to refine me into everything he desires for me to be, is that one day whenever I make it home and I have to stand and look him in the face and, and do what uh, some of the pastoral epistles talk about, is be held to a little bit different standard than everybody else because of vocational ministry. One of the things that terrifies me is that Jesus will look at me and say, how come your people didn't know any more about this than they did? And so, friends, I'm just committed all the way around to, like, no stone in the gospel is unturnable. And for me to be standing in the same spot exactly a year when I started here, that probably doesn't shock you at this point. As if I've done anything, I've been authentic with you, and I think at this point we all think, well, I don't think there's too much he'll keep away from. You're right. And so as we talk through this book over the next few weeks, I want you to know that, that um, it, it may get uncomfortable, and that's probably a good thing. Uh, but if there ever comes a point where we need to have further conversation, we can do that because I'm just a phone call away or a meeting away, a cup of coffee, uh, and we can sort through anything. And, hey, I also want to um, own this before I launch into our conversation about uh, perspectives this morning in this book. You remember from the book of Genesis, uh, I believe it's in chapter 32, where Jacob is about to return to meet his brother um, and, and he's kind of pretty nervous what's going to happen. And so in the, in the story, he sends his friends across, uh, he sends two of his wives. It's kind of weird when you have a romantic discussion and the guy's got two wives, but that's a different story. Um, he sends two of his wives and his kids and all his possessions across the river Jabbok, and he stays alone on the other side, and he finds himself engaged in a wrestling match with an angel. And he wrestles and wrestles and grapples with the angel all night long. And as the sun begins to come up, the angel um, actually demands of Jacob to let him go. And Jacob won't let him go. And you know the story. He says, I will not let you go until you first bless me, right? And so the angel, in pronouncing a blessing on him, does one more than that. He touches Jacob on his hip and knocks Jacob's hip out of joint. And from that point forward, for the rest of Jacob's life, he walks with a limp. Sort of emblematic of everything in Jacob's life, right? And in a postmodern world, I need to be honest with you, when we talk about romantic love and sexuality and all these things that are going to be uncomfortable for the next week, I need to be honest with you and just tell you from my own personal perspective, 
I walk with a limp on a lot of the things we're going to talk about. I'm not clean in this at all. In fact, uh, you just need to know from the get-go that I don't preach it from a position, I don't offer this from a position of what you should do. I only offer this as a position of what the gospel entails for us, friend. And so much as it's been um, uh, agonizing for me to think through and pray through what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks, I have realized more times than not, I am very much like Jacob on, the, on this topic. I very much walk with a limp still. And I will be 43 in a mere few months now, and I promise you that Jesus continues, continues, continues from my perspective, and I just want to be honest with you. He continues to make my limp, my lameness around inappropriate desires, around inappropriate all things related to sexuality. He continues to make that right. But it is not from a position of being fully made new that I speak to you on these subjects. And you just need to know that. And so with all that set up, you're like, oh my gosh, I hurry if we hurry, we can run for the exits. Well, that's okay. Um, but we're going to talk just real quick um, about several things. And today is not so much a day where we exegete through Scripture. It is more of a day where we get context, you get some backstory for the things that we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. And so one of the things you need to talk about, and it comes from the Ephesians text that will be on the screen today, and let's just read the Ephesians text real quick. It uh, begins in chapter 5 and uh, verse 20, uh, 22. Let's just read there. Uh, wives, Paul writes to his friends at Ephesus, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband's head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Next slide, sir. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ has loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, making clean her, may cleanse her by washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing at all, but that she only be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. You'll recognize it from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. For this mystery is great, friends, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Friends, I read this text because it's somewhat provocative in the postmodern world we live in, but it's emblematic of what we're going to talk about in the Song of Solomon. It's one of the perspectives you and I, we have to keep in mind when we read the book together, is that marriage, as it were, romantic love expressed in marriage, as it were, is in some real way an example of what it's like to be in relationship individually with God through Christ. In fact, Paul goes out to say that it really goes beyond what we can put words to. It's a great mystery. But there is so much of the marriage relationship that demonstrates for us or gives us context for what it means for the... To, to have an appropriate arena for sexual expression. And so Paul writes about this, and he's very passionate when he writes about it too, um, as he writes to his friends at Ephesus. And so for us, over the next few weeks, I use this text to only offer you this, one perspective that you have to bring when we read through, walk through the Song of Songs together. You have to come to the book from the church perspective 
when you said yes to Jesus, you became in a supernatural and mysterious yet very real and tangible way, you became a part of the bride of Christ. And in fact, Jesus' whole mission, Paul says in its own way, is to present his bride, the church, without blemish, blameless, and without spot. And so some of the things that we're going to talk about in terms of romantic love and relational competencies, desire, pursuit, and consummation, yes, by that I mean sexual intercourse, um, it is, is some of that, friends, it's on a real level is how we are to engage with God in Christ as being members of the church. It, is a, it, it, it really defies language. It defies what you and I can put language to, but it also defies, it, it demands that we make the attempt. So we come at it from one perspective, and that is as the bride of Christ. Jesus being the groom, us being the bride, we are always in some supernatural ro romantic relationship with God in Christ that we have to spend our time investing in and think and working through just like our own marriage relationships in the world. Second perspective that you have to bring to the book is the individual perspective. And by perspective, I mean you always have to know how you relate to the text. And for us Methodists, the individual perspective of Song of Songs is pretty easy to do. Right? We Methodists believe in this thing called prevenient grace. And friends, if I can tell you anything about Jesus Christ, is that he is a lover beyond compare. He knows how to woo and draw and convince you of just how beautiful you are, just how much he loves you. In fact, he is by, by, in the deep south. Jesus is behind every pine tree trying to tell you how lovely you are. He makes Shakespeare pathetic. Lo, may I count the ways how beautiful you are. And so on an individual level, you just need to know that some of the stuff that we're talking about as it is between a man and a woman in the Song of Songs also telegraphs into our relationship between Christ and us as individuals. So in other words, you always need to hear when the lover is the man's voice, is speaking sweet nothings and looking her up and down and going, mm, 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 mm. You always need to keep in mind, friends, that that in some regard is how Jesus sees all of humanity. Jesus sees you as a love, love, love of his life, the apple of his eye. He is not tricked or turned away by what kind of person we are, and he will never stop wooing you. He will never stop pursuing you in a very deep and intimate way. Yes, a way that is equivalent to intercourse on a spiritual level. I know that's starting to creep y'all out. I, I get it. But, but on a way that we can't really get our heads around. But you always need to keep in mind that the God of all creation pursues you like no other person ever has pursued you, man or woman. And you just need to come to the book with that perspective that Jesus, through the gospel, is pursuing you still even if you said yes to him a long time ago. You also are going to have to, and let's just get down to the brass tacks of it all, you each come to the book from your perspective of your gender. So men, you come to the book of Song of Songs from the perspective of, well, a man and everything that entails in North American culture. And so here's the point that I want you, I would invite you men to come to the, to the Song of Songs um, book over the few, next few weeks. Here's the perspective I would encourage you to come. I would encourage you to come to the book with this view. And it is, what does it look like to, to deeply pursue the woman of your life? And how is it, how is it that she is to experience the deep love of God through the, your love for her. For if Song of Songs does anything, friends, it does this, men, from our perspective. It, it, it encourages us, it demands that we love the woman of our life 
in a way that is equal to the way Jesus loves his church. Now, ladies, I don't want you to feel left out either because you're going to come to the book too. And so here's, here's for you all. Here's, here's what it means from, even from the Ephesians text, right? Is that what does it look like for you to love your men, the men of your life, in such a way that they understand what it was like for Jesus to love his Father fully and without sin, but always to be submissive to his Father. I know this doesn't get a lot of play in our culture because it's just like, I'm telling you not to be you. No, 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 no. Here's what I'm telling you from the book. Is that for you to come from the perspective of, you ladies can only offer the gift that no man could ever offer in this regard. To demonstrate in some real way for all of us, particularly men, what it's like to live in the type of relationship, submissive relationship that exists in the Trinity that exists between Jesus, the full-on Son of God, and God the Father, the Godhead. Yes, that goes beyond what you can even think or ask or imagine. And so, ladies, when you come to this particular book and look at this, and you see, like what we'll talk about next week, where the pursuer, the dominant character in the Song of Songs is the woman. And she ain't at all bashful that she's in for her man. She ain't at all bashful. In fact, there's a few times that it gets just downright, whoa. And so what does it look like? So those are the perspectives that you have to have. And then there's some other assumptions that are running in the background of the book that you would have to really labor to dig out. But you just need to know that they're running in the background. Because if you went home today, and I hope you do, read the Song of Songs. Uh, it's kind of short, but if you just went home and read it today, probably two things that happen. You get, number one, to chapter four and quit. It's a hard book to read. It's ancient poetry, and they start talking about climbing the palm trees and shaking down the, uh, all the fruit of the palm trees and going into the garden and smelling all the aromatic spices that exist in the garden and, and, and being amongst the lilies. You would look at it and think, well, this is just stupid language. Well, if we were begin to unspin some of what that means, um, you'd be mortified. It's, it, it, it's R-rated. But you'd get bored probably if you wrote it and like that and just left it. Two, if you didn't get bored, here's what would happen. If you got a hold of the language and you really wrestled with it, you would think that what um, most, some of you lived through in the 1960s where this whole expression of free love and don't do whatever, um, the modern version of like Tinder world, um, you would think that, that the Bible condones such things. Because, lo, beloved, like they know how to talk to each other in romantic relationship. And, and it, it leaves open that this might be the way that you should talk to everybody. And so it's really important that you get some context for the book today. Because you could get off in the theological high weeds without it. And so here are a few things. These are assumptions that are running in the book. The whole time, from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 8. And you just need to keep these in mind this morning and throughout the next few weeks. Um, and I'll try to hit them quickly because these are how, this is why it ended up in the canon. These are some of the, the, the waypoints, the classical marks of Christian teaching as it relates to romantic love. You remember we talked to, about uh, types of love a few weeks ago. Here's one of the assumptions that's running in the background. In classical Christian teaching, we understand that romantic love as displayed in the song is a type of love that is proper and is only between the holy otherness of women and men. In fact, and let me say it just a little bit differently, is that 
classical Christian understanding of this book says that the only proper place for romantic love to be displayed is between women and men. And they go just a bit further because in Scripture, sex early on equals marriage. Okay? So, in other words, is that um, the only proper venue for sexual expression is inside, here's the next assumption, marriage. Is that it's the only place designed by God in, in, in covenantal relationship is the only place for sexual expression and it to be appropriate is inside of marriage relationship. And that's meant to be between the holy otherness that God designed in the book of Genesis between men and women. Secondly, is that this one's always running in the background too, is that sexual, sexuality, this romantic expression, I touched on it just a second ago, classical Christian teaching understands that God's intent and design for sexual expression is limited exclusively among partners of the opposite sex. That's always running in the background. And, and listen, I understand like that brings the elephant into the room in terms of modern um, North American cultural debate. Listen, we're not, we're not even going near anything about what anybody's against. We're just talking about what romantic love looks like between men and women as it is in Scripture. That's my only job. My job isn't to make social commentary. My job's just to report the news that's in the Scripture. And so we're talking about that particular thing. So it's not any kind of political view. It's just what's in Scripture. And again, secondly, is that marriage, as it's defined for us in Scripture, a man shall leave his father and mother from Genesis and cleave unto his wife. The two shall become one flesh. This it, marriage for us, friends, it's running in the background of the book, is always between suitable partners partners again of the same of opposite sex also running in the background is this notion and Paul touched on it this morning is this idea of virginity and in classical Christian teaching understands sexual intimacy to be holy and sacred offering of our bodies to another person free of blemish and without a spot so let me say that again is that in the same way, friends, as we talk about virginity, whether it's related to um, men or women, it, it, the, whole, the reason it's important inside of romantic relationship is it is in a similar way an offering of ourselves free from blemish and spot as Jesus offered himself free from blemish and without spot to atone for the sins of the world. So that the romantic relationship, when we come to it, we don't become dragging any baggage. But again, I will own what I said from the start. That is not my experience. And I recognize it's not everybody else's experience. But always running in the background, when you read Song of Songs, is, is this notion that Sexuality is meant to be expressed in marriage with a single partner, which gets us to the last thing of monogamy. Now, you can read the Bible and see, in fact, in some translations of the Bible, this book is called the Song of Solomon. And if you read anything about Solomon, particularly in the book of First Kings, you'll discover that Solomon didn't necessarily subscribe to monogamy. Given the fact that he had 300 concubines, and 700 wives. So let me just put the math in on that one. This brother was trying to service a thousand women. Mm -mm -mm. I don't know what to do with that. So let, let's just be honest. Is that when I say that monogamy is the way that it's, it's meant to be, not even all Bible believers and all the people in the Scripture believe in monogamy. But classical Christian teaching has always taught that marriage, sexual expression is between opposite sex partners in the marriage relationship for a lifetime. And here's why. You remember, God is pretty, he's pretty passionate about us not having any other gods, isn't he? 
He's pretty passionate about there being nobody else between us and him. So if the marriage relationship, if the romantic love relationship is some way an, a, a sign and symbol of our relationship with God, like how many of y'all going to invite somebody else into y'all's bed? That pretty well sums it up, don't it? Like this is why it's monogamous relationship. And what Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he instructs his friends in Corinth that they shouldn't be with people outside of the marriage relationship because sex equals marriage. And he says it this way, is that would you marry yourself to a prostitute? And so this is why it's important. This throughout Scripture for us, friends, it has been that marriage and sexual expression is between lifelong partners. And so you just need to, as we get ready to um, go through the book together, you just need to kind of keep those things in mind. And let me say this, too. And then we'll move to our time of communion together. As I said this morning, I walk with a limp on these issues. And maybe you do too. Maybe you hear somebody like me say it's supposed to be a monogamous relationship. And you were in one that doesn't exist anymore. You were married, and now you're not. Have you been married, and then you weren't? Maybe you've been married again. Maybe you're inclined to look at Song of Psalms and say, or Song of Solomon and say, um, Hmm, well, I guess Jesus wouldn't have me because that ain't the case. Nope. Jesus has this great way of taking us who walk with a limp and transforming that. Turning our lameness into the ability to run again. Or maybe you come to this conversation with baggage in the past around sexuality. Maybe you know somebody or you're one of those people who really doesn't understand how, um, how romantic love is, is only to be between opposite sex partners. That's okay. The place to come is to Jesus. Because Jesus is not scared of your limp or mine either. Or maybe, just maybe, it's, um, you know, Skeletons in the closet. Didn't come to my marriage with free from blemish and without spot. That's okay too. If we're submitted to Jesus, whether by design or something that was perpetrated, submitted to Jesus. He redeems that. In fact, he's in the business of delivering his bride, as Paul says, free from blemish and without spot. He's in the business of taking past and transforming it into something beautiful. And so as we journey through talking about this particularly provocative book, my encouragement to you is this is that when you find yourself walking with a limp, don't hide out. Bring it to Jesus. Come and submit those things to Him. For again, He loves you like no one else. And He will deliver you free from blemish and without spot to our Heavenly Father. He will transform everything if you'll just let him. And in fact, that transformation can begin as we share in communion together. And those of you who are serving, if you wouldn't mind coming forward.